Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone, and welcome back from the weekend. Let's return where we left off last Friday in the book, The History of Romanism by John Dowling. And I'd like to make some comments uh, and explanation so that my readers can follow along the events that took place in England uh, between the Pope and the King and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Remember, we're in that period of time when most of Europe, if not all of Europe, was subservient to the papacy. The Pope crowned all the kings, and the kings did his bidding. But England was a tough nut to crack for the papacy. England had received the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the kings of England were not so quick to accept the Pope as his, as the so-called uh, vicar of Christ. And so the papacy was constantly trying to force the king of England to bend his knee to the Pope. In other words, to make the king of England, England and the kingdom of England a vassal of the papacy, so that the king of England would obey the Pope, just like the rest of the kings of Europe obeyed the Pope. Okay, so the papacy is constantly looking for an opportunity to assert itself as king of kings in England. Not only lord of lords, the, the bishop of bishops, the chief bishop of the Church of England, but also the king of kings. Now, the current king of England was not so eager to accept the authority of the papacy over his head. And the king of England thought it his prerogative to choose and to uh, invest the uh, prelates of the Roman Catholic Church in England. The king of England wished to deny the Pope that power and to take it to himself. All right? So, the king of England reluctantly uh, appointed Anselm to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. But Anselm was a papist, and Anselm wanted to receive his office as Archbishop of Canterbury from the Pope. From the Pope. Okay? So, uh, Archbishop uh, Anselm, so much as snubbing the King of England, went to Rome to receive his pontifical robes, his archbishopic his archbishopric robes, his pall, they call it, the vestments of the archbishop, those tokens of his office that make it official that he's the archbishop of Canterbury. And uh, this is an insult to the king of Rome, or rather to the king of England. This is a, a, an outward sign that Anselm holds his allegiance not to the king of England, but to his pope in Rome. Now, while away at Rome, the archbishop, we're, we're reading at the top, uh, rather the second half of uh, uh, subsection 29 on page 269. We're near the top of page 269. And if you're following along in your book, you'll find, you'll find me about a paragraph uh, above the ending of this subsection. It says, while at Rome, the archbishop, that is Anselm, was present at a papal council head, uh, held in 1098 A.D., in which it was declared by Pope Urban that the king of England deserved to be excommunicated for his conduct toward Anselm. Okay? In other words, the king of England insisted that Anselm be appointed by the king and not the pope and that he could not take his office unless he swore allegiance to the king and renounced his allegiance to the pope. But tipping his hand, Anselm went to Rome to receive his authority from the pope and not the king. And so while in Rome, 
receiving the pall from the Pope, his authority, his to the, the tokens of his office from the Pope, it was decreed by the Pope that the King of England should be excommunicated for the way he was dealing with Anselm. In other words, making him try, attempting to make him a vassal of the king and robbing the Pope of Anselm's loyalty. All right, it says, but at the conquest of that prelate, or rather at the request of that prelate, the execution of the sentence of excommunication was postponed. So it makes it look like Anselm is being charitable to the king. The pope has declared his excommunication, and Anselm says, let's postpone the, uh, the uh, carrying out of this sentence. Okay, now it says, at this council, the famous canon against lay investitures was confirmed. Okay, now I want to explain once again, if you're not familiar, <coughs> this process of elevating Anselm to his uh, archbishopric, the Archbishop of Canterbury, is called the investiture. He's being invested into that office. He's being officially elevated to that office. Okay? Now, who officially invests Anselm into the office of Canterbury? Is it the king or is it the pope? Now, the pope insists that if he alone has the divine right to pick the kings, how is it that the kings have any power whatsoever to elevate the church officials, the Archbishop of Canterbury? All right. So in this Roman Catholic canon law adopted at this council, the king of England is regarded as a layman. Okay, just a pew sitter. He's got no authority whatsoever in the church. Just a layman. And therefore he has no power. The papacy asserts that only the Pope has the power of investiture. And that all of those invested by the Pope are loyal to the Pope and the Pope only. All right, he says, at this council, the famous canon, that is the Roman Catholic canon law, against lay investitures was confirmed, denouncing excommunication against all laymen, that is, all kings, who presume to grant investitures of any ecclesiastical benefices, that is, church offices, as in this case, the Archbishopric of Canterbury, and against all clergymen who accept such investitures. In other words, if Anselm had accepted his investiture from the king, this canon would have excommunicated Anselm. All right? First, it denounced excommunication against all laymen, that is, all kings, who would presume to grant an investiture of any church office and also excommunication against any churchman who accepted such investitures or did homage to the temporal princes. All right? Now, I, I want you to get your head out of England now for a second. We, we know this took place in England. But it took place also in Germany. Remember, it, it took place between Henry IV, the big quarrel between Henry IV and, and, and uh, Pope Gregory VII was over investitures. Okay, this is how the papacy successfully brought the, 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 the uh, emperor into vassalage. It was over who had the power to invest church offices. Was it the pope? or the king, or the emperor in that case. We're doing the same thing in England. Okay, The Pope succeeded in humiliating Henry IV over this issue of investiture, and he intends to do the same thing in England. 
to make a vassal out of the King of England over the question of investiture. Who has the power to invest the church offices? And it says, the reason assigned for this canon by the Pope, as related by one who was present in the council and heard his speech, is horrid and impious in the highest degree. Okay? Here is the reason why that the Pope gave why he alone should be able to invest the offices of the church. Quote, It is execrable, says His Holiness, to see those hands which create God. Remember, the priest creates God on the altar when he holds up the piece of bread and he pronounces, this is the body of Christ and the little bell rings. He says the famous or uh, the 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 uh, impious Latin words hoc es corpus meum. This is the body of Christ. Is what that means, and this is when transubstantiation takes place. And even though the wafer still looks like wafer, it smells like wafer, it feels like wafer, it touch, it tastes like wafer, like bread. It's the literal blood, body, soul, and divinity of Christ. It's only a mere accident that it continues to look taste, smell, and feel like bread. And that this bread now becoming the literal flesh of Jesus Christ, the Pope, the priest has just created his own creator. This is the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. To be a Roman Catholic, you must believe on pain of excommunication that the priest has the power to create his creator and then to offer him once again on the altar as a, as, a, as a perpetual sacrifice for the redemption of sin. Okay? He says it is execrable, execrable ec, easy for me to say, execrable, says the holiness. In other words, disgusting, says his holiness the Pope, to see those hands which create God, that is the priest, the creator of all things, a power never granted to angels. No, God never granted to angels the power to create their own creator, as do the Roman Catholic priests. And, after, and, and to offer him, the creator, that is Jesus, in sacrifice to the Father for the redemption of the whole world, to put that priest who creates his own creator and offers him as a perpetual sacrifice for the redemption of the whole world, to put him in the hands of a prince, listen carefully, stained with blood and polluted day and night with obscene contacts. Unquote. In other words, it is abominable if the Pope would allow such a disgusting, filthy person as a king whose hands are dripping with blood and who uh, are engaged day and night in obscene contacts, uh, in, in, in obscene contacts to have in his, to hold in his hands the office or, or the power to elevate the priests. I hope I'm explaining this so you can understand it. Let me try again. The Pope is making the point that only he, the vicar of Christ, is so spotless and so virtuous as to be authorized to create, uh, to elevate into office the priests who literally have the power to create their own creator and to offer him a sacrifice on the altar as the great high priest of Christianity. And to allow a king to do this, to elevate a priest, in other words, to be the, uh, the creator of the one who creates God on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church, is an abomination. It's unspeakable. I mean, after all, the kings of the earth's hands are bloody with war. They're the takers of life, right? The, 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 the Roman Catholic Church views the, the, uh, 
the kingdoms of the world, the kings and the kingdoms of the world, to be the battle axe of the church. When the church declares a war against heretics or against uh, Turks or whatever, uh, whoever he decides to aim his retribution at, it's up to the kings of the earth to shed that blood, to go to war, as we saw in the Crusades. So this disqualifies the kings from the sanctity necessary to elevate a priest who is the creator of all th- who is the creator of the creator of all things and not only is their hand stained with blood but quote polluted day and night with obscene contacts okay what's he talking about here well in case you don't realize it the pope is privy to every private sin of every king on the earth. The Pope knows it all. The kings of the earth can't keep a secret from the papacy. The papacy is privy to every private sin of every king on the earth. The intelligence system of the Roman Catholic Church is such that the Pope is privy to every private as well as public sins of all the kings of the earth. Now, how is that possible? Through the confessional box. Every king of the earth is supposed to have a confessor to confess his sins. Auricular confession. That's a tenet of the Roman Catholic Church. That's one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. They must enter the confessional box and say, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And then he recites all of his public and private sins. Some of the most intimate, some of the most secret, some of the most diabolical crimes and sins that a king of the earth can commit must be confessed to his Roman Catholic confessor, another priest. A priest for the purpose of collecting data by which the Pope may be informed and to use to blackmail and to help force the kings of the earth to be his vassals. Now what we have here is a quote from this Pope not only acknowledging the blood-stained hands of the king, but also his most private and obscene contacts. This is a public, this is language written in a, in a public uh, uh, council where all the priests and all the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church and even kings of other states are present. And the Pope is literally using, although the language isn't specific, uses the term obscene contacts. His hands are stained with blood, but not only just blood of war, but are soiled and polluted day and night with obscene contacts. So the Pope is simply telling to the telling the King of England, "I know your every secret, buddy, and you're going to do what I want you to do, or I'm going to talk about your sins publicly." Right? blackmail spiritual blackmail and this is forbidden I mean we have but one confessor and that is Christ and when we confess our sins we do it in private in our own prayer closet to the only high priest who can be trusted with that information the only high priest who can give us repentance of our sins and the only one who can grant us absolution from our sins by how by atoning for them with his own blood no priest of the Roman Catholic Church can atone for sins that is a status left alone to God himself 
For a man to say that he can conf- that he can uh, absolve sin is blasphemy. And that's what the Roman Catholic Church does. And not only do they blaspheme, but they extort the obedience of the kings of the earth by threats of revealing publicly their most private and obscene sins. Okay? This is why we hear of scandal in Washington, D.C. Who do you think is responsible for all of these dirty little secrets that are constantly coming out of Washington, D.C.? It's simply demonstrating the power of the popes and the priests over the, over the political leaders of our country. All right? It's extortion. By force, the papacy extorts the loyalty and obedience of the kings of the earth because he knows their every secret sin. And this pope so much as told the king of England, I know everything about you. I know what you do every day and every night. Because your confessor told me. Okay? Now, are you going to play ball or not? This is essentially how the papacy conforms every king to his vassal. And that's how the Pope forced the King of England into his hands. Clay in his hands. Now, After the Pope made all this statement, it says, to which all the fathers of the council responded, Amen, Amen. And these transactions said the historian Edmer, I was present and all these things I saw and heard, unquote. So this historian is recounting eyewitness testimony, firsthand eyewitness testimony. This is how the Pope behaved at this council. So guess what? Anselm's going to go back to England, and he is not going to bend the knee to the king. His king is the pope and the pope alone. And the king is going to be the pope's vassal, or every private sin that he's ever confessed to a priest is going to be exposed. Okay? This is the power of the popes. Now, subsection 31, page 269, if you're following along, it says, William Rufus was succeeded on the throne of England in 1100 A.D. by Henry I, whose reign extended to the long period of 35 years. He was the youngest son of William the Conqueror and got his reins of government into his hands by supplanting his older brother, Robert. But having seceded, he set himself with all his might to conciliate, that is, to befriend all of those who were likely either to support or to disturb him in the possession of the prize that he had obtained, and especially the Pope and the court of Rome. In other words, he was a bootlicker. He was going to make sure that he made friends with everybody so that nobody would oppose him, and especially the Pope of Rome. Now, it says, with a view to this, he recalled the Archbishop of Canterbury from his exile. All right? So he's going to bring Anselm back to the kingdom of England and seat him in his office. This should please the Pope and Anselm, correct? It says, with a view to this, that is, befriending everyone, reconciling himself to everyone, he recalled the Archbishop of Canterbury from his exile, and accordingly... Anselm, the Archbishop of of Canterbury, landed at Dover on the 23rd of September in A.D. 1100. Now, we'll continue with this after the break. You're listening to the Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month. And you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25. Or any single program on MP3 CD or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, one 800 375 4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. If you wish to contact me, my email address is tom at cwaves.us. It's tom at cwaves.us. And the website is inquisitionupdate.wordpress.com or .inquisitionupdate.org. It'll get you to the same place. Now, I just wonder. I've continued. Just we just kind of skipped right through King William and went to uh, how his youngest son uh, acceded to the throne. I wonder if any of my listeners noticed how abruptly. Uh, we just kind of passed over William without having anything further to say about William after the Pope threatened to out his dirty laundry. It's kind of strange, isn't it, that there's no more discussion about the quarrel between the King of England, William Rufus, and the, and the Pope? The war just kind of abruptly ended, didn't it? What do we take from this? Well, William was whipped. The Pope whipped him like a dog. Threatened out all of his dirty laundry. And we know by the by what uh, takes place immediately after this discussion, after this council where the Pope threatened out the king's dirty laundry, all of a sudden he's replaced by his youngest son. Okay? The king died. That's what happens. You imagine what sins he might have committed that the Pope knew about that he might expose to the whole world if if King Rufus William Rufus didn't just knuckle under. <laughs> we can only assume that William knuckled under, and we can tell by the the behavior of his youngest son that his youngest son was not going to follow in his footsteps and challenge the power of the Pope. Or at least he was going to seem to not challenge the power of the Pope. He didn't want to anger the Pope. No king of the earth wants to anger the Pope. Because the Pope has the goods on all of them. And he can expose them at his will. He can excommunicate them. He can eternally damn them. And they must be his vassals. All right, says in section th- subsection 31, William Rufus was seceded on the throne of England 
in 1100 A.D. by Henry I, whose reign extended to the long period of 35 years. He was the youngest son of William the Conqueror and got the reins of government into his hand by supplanting his older brother, Robert. But having succeeded, he set himself uh, having succeeded, he set himself with all his might to conciliate all those who were likely to either to support or to disturb him in the possession of the prize he had obtained, that is, the kingdom, and especially the Pope and the court of Rome. With a view to this, he, rec- he recalled the Archbishop of Canterbury, Anselm, from his exile, And accordingly, Anselm landed at Dover on the 23rd of September in A.D. 1100. A few days after he landed, he was introduced to the king at Salisbury, who received him with every possible mark of affection and respect. Okay? You don't want to tick off Anselm. Look what he did to my father, right? It says, but the cordiality was of short continuance. The king was far from being an amiable character. And Anselm, too, was the same unbending prelate still. And the instant he was called upon to do homage to the king for the temporalities of his see, he met it with a flat refusal and produced the canon of the late Council of Rome in vindication of his conduct, and at the same time declaring that if the king insisted on his pretensions to the homage of the clergy, in other words, if the king insisted on making the prelates of the Roman Catholic Church swear allegiance to him, he could hold no communion with him, and he would immediately leave the kingdom. So immediately we're faced with the same controversy. The king, under the pretense of ingraciously receiving Anselm back into the kingdom, puts him immediately to the test. You're going to swear allegiance to me and renounce your allegiance to the Pope or not? And Anselm flatly refuses to bend the knee to the king. He's going to serve the Pope no matter what it takes. He's going to obey the canon law that was passed during his... his, uh, uh, exile, and he's going to be loyal to the Pope, and only the Pope. Now, it says, further, King, if you insist on making me pay homage to you, I will have nothing to do with you, and I will immediately leave the kingdom and go back to Rome. Well, what do you what do you what do you think that the the king is going to he's going to see a replay of what happened to his father right he says this threw the king into great perplexity for on the one hand he was very reluctant to resign the right of bestowing ecclesiastical benefices and of receiving the homage of the prelates and on the other hand he dreaded the departure of the archbishop anselm who might take part with his brother Robert, then in Normandy, and preparing to assert his right to the throne of England. So the king knows that if Anselm leaves England, he's going to team up with his older brother, who is the rightful heir to the throne, and there's going to be a civil war in England. A papal civil war in England to overthrow the king. It says, in this critical juncture, the king proposed, or rather begged, a truce till both parties could send ambassadors to the Pope to know his final determination, to which Anselm, at the solicitations of the nobility, consented. Sure, why wouldn't Anselm uh, consent to this? You've got to ask yourself a question. Why would the king who knows what position the Pope's going to take in all this, why would the king propose 
to send legates to the Pope to get his decision in this matter. You see, the king has already become a vassal of the Pope. If the king did not regard the Pope as Christ's vicar on earth, why would he send legates to the Pope to get his decision? Okay, so there, there's the error the king has already conceded to the power of the Pope by suggesting they pre uh, present their legates and representatives to the Pope to make, let him decide what's going to happen in England over this archbishopric and who, who the archbishop is going to swear his fealty to, the Pope or the king. The king knows if this goes the wrong way, the papacy is going to side with Robert, his older brother, and they're going to kick him out of office. He's going to lose the kingdom, and his older brother is going to become king. It's a race to see who can ingratiate themselves the most and the best to the pope. The man of sin. The son of perdition. Now, this is the king of England, where the gospel was first preached, even possibly by Paul the Apostle. And here we are, not many centuries after that, the kings of England are bending the knee to the Pope, the very man of sin, the son of perdition. Do you suppose possibly, just possibly, the same thing has happened here in the United States of America? As most unlikely as it is that England would fall to papal uh, authority, what about America? How much effect and influence do you think the cardinals and the bishops and the archbishops have over our government? I tell you, far more than they ever had in England. Okay? It says, in this critical conjuncture, the king proposed, or rather begged a truce, till the parties could send ambassadors to the Pope to know his final determination, to which Anselm, at the solicitations of the nobility, consented. Do you know the Pope can blackmail anyone in Washington, D.C. that he wants by the same means and methods by which he blackmailed the kings of England? He knows their every secret sin. There's no sanctity of the confessional box in the Roman Catholic Church. And because of the power that the Pope has through the information that they receive from the confessors of the powerful politicians in Washington, D.C., the Pope can do whatever he wants to do. And the kings of the earth must follow him like the Pied Piper. That's how he rules over the kings of the earth, by treachery. All right? This is what the kings of the earth get when they confess their sin to an agent of the Pope. Blackmail. They become vassals. It really makes a difference to whom you confess your sins. Not once in the Scripture is a man ever commanded to confess his sins before another fleshly man. Now, you might argue, Thomas says, confess your faults one to another. Yeah, you can confess that you got some acne in certain places, but there is not a flesh and blood man on this earth that I would trust with my sins. And no one less so than the popes and the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. And stop to think that the, pri the pastors and the priesters of the Protestant and Evangelical churches are conforming to the very image of the Roman Catholic Church. They use the same means and methods. They become aware of your secret sins so they can blackmail you with them. There's only one entity under God's heaven that I can confess my sins, and that's Jesus, the one who died for my sins. And I don't confess my sins to men. I wish to be forgiven, not blackmailed. And so I don't concede to the pretended powers of the popes and the priests and the priesters and the pastors of this world. They have no power over me. 
not any power that God gave them at least. And so because there has always been a Protestant sentiment to never confess your sins before a man, and since information, damning information about true Protestants is so hard to get, They've simply passed laws in this country that the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, and the local police department can monitor everything you do on your computer. They can monitor all the trans, the, the transmissions you, you make over your cell phone. They can key log every uh, uh, keystroke that you make on the keypad of your computer. It's everything you, every time you use a piece of electronic communication device, everything you do and say is recorded. It's just like confessing to the priest. There's no privacy anymore. Now, you may still have some privacy if you have a landline phone, because they still have to get a court order to monitor your landline transmissions you still may have some form of privacy if you write snail mail. In other words, sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil and write a letter to someone, stuff it in an envelope, lick it and seal it and stamp it and tape it so nobody can open it and send it to somebody. Those communications may still, in some degree, hold your secrets. But if you use a cell phone, if you use a computer, all these convenient forms of communication, you have absolutely no privacy. And as a matter of fact, all these documents that we have to sign when we go to the doctor having to do with uh, privacy, they make sure that you have privacy except the government. Okay? The government can come in and look at your medical records. They can look at any legal document at their whim. There's absolutely no privacy. And, of course, none of this would be possible if the United States was a Protestant country. It's Roman Catholicism that says... You cannot keep a secret from the Pope, the Vicar of Christ. Okay, just as Christ sees even in the dark, the Pope can see even in the dark. Roman Catholic canon law stipulates that every man, woman, and child must confess their sins to the Pope to receive absolution. And since we don't willingly go to the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church and confess our sins before sinful, wicked pedophiles, they can have, by divine right, authority to access everything you do on the Internet, everything you do on your cell phone, and every other form of electronic communication. You have no promise of secrecy. And that's why we have all these new forms of communication. To defeat our God-given right not to confess our sins to filthy, sin-sick men in black robes. Okay? I bet you never thought of this, did you? That we have all these electronic means of communication isn't for our convenience. It's for their benefit. It's data mining. Every man, woman, and child in this world confesses their sins to the high priest of popery. And that is the government, the civil power. There's an unholy alliance between the governments of this world and the papacy. And anything and everything you say, do, and think will be held against you in the tribunals to come. Okay? Rome has achieved godlike status in the world by the technologies that we think we benefit from. 
Okay. Now, subsection 32. In due time, the messengers had been dispatched to Rome, returned with letters from Pope Pascal the Third, uh, Pascal the Second, who had succeeded Pope Urban, in which His Holiness asserted in the strongest terms that the Church and all of its revenues belong to Saint Peter and his successors. Okay. So the Church and all of its revenues belong. To the popes. It says, and the emperors, kings, and princes had no right to confer investiture of benefices to the clergy or to demand homage from them. That's Roman Catholic canon law. Only the pope picks both the kings and the prelates of the church the offices of the church. This has to do with investiture. Only the Pope has the power to pick the benefices of the church, the the the, the, uh, officials of the church. Okay? And only the Pope can command homage from them. Roman Catholic canon law denounces excommunication against any Roman Catholic priest of any rank who swears an allegiance to the government, to the king. And it says, This he endeavored to prove by several texts of Scripture, most grossly misapplied, you might understand, and by other arguments which are either blasphemous or nonsensical, of which take this specimen. Here's here's an example. Quote, How abominable is it for a son to beget his father, and a man to create his God. And are not priests your fathers and your gods? Okay, do you understand? He says, the effect of this curious piece of papal reasoning was not precisely such as His Holiness anticipated. The king was rather irritated than convinced by it. In other words, the Pope says... Priests and the popes of the Roman Catholic Church are your gods. And you are our sons. You kings, you princes, you potentates of the world, you are our sons. Now, if we allow you, our sons, to elevate one of your fathers to office, It's as if you had begotten your own father. You see the logic that the popes use to justify their exclusive right of investiture? This is the reasoning of the papacy. That just as a man does not conceive or beget his own father, neither do the kings of the earth elevate priests to their office. He says again, listen to what he says, How abominable is it for a son, that is a king, to beget or place into office his father, his priest, and a man to create his God. How abominable is it for a man, a king, to create his God by putting him in office? I... I don't want to confuse the issue here, but but isn't it um, the men of the Roman Catholic Church, the priests who are mere men, who say they have the power to create their own God? You see the hypocrisy, the lying hypocrisy of all of this? This logic wouldn't convince a child of any reason, and yet it has deceived the whole world. It puts the kings of the earth flatly on their knees before this so-called God in Rome with this abominable reasoning and lying contradiction. (laughs) Because everyone must know in their heart of hearts the priests of the Roman Catholic Church are just men, and yet they presume to create God on the altar of the Roman Catholic Church? 
This church is full of abominations and contradictions and, and hypocrisy. This quote shouldn't confuse a child, yet it has confused and confounded the whole world. Again, listen to what he says. How abominable is it for a son to beget his father and a man to create his God? Do you see the hypocrisy of this? The Roman Catholic Church, by canon law, swears that a man behind the pulpit of a Roman Catholic Church has the power to create his God. And not only that, but the priests of the Roman Catholic Church in their relationship to the kings of the earth are their gods. And thereby, the, the kings of the earth do not have power to elevate priests to their priestly positions. Because to do so would be like creating with their own hands God. All powerful signs and lying wonders, lying hypocrisies. Does not the Scripture speak of the Roman Catholic Church in specific, undeniable terms? It certainly does. And it's amazing that the world can't comprehend it. How is it that the kings of the earth still pay their homage to such a source of illogic, violation of the scriptures, violation of common sense? But they all do. Every king of the earth pays his homage and, and, and uh, obeisance to the papacy and his priests. So much so that the priests of the Roman Catholic Church are the shadow government of every land. They oversee the temporal power. And by threats of exposing their sins and every other abomination, the kings of the earth are forced to be the vassals of these demons in Rome. And guess who's caught in the middle? You and me. The ones who were supposed to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. You see, it's time for Christ to come. It's time for us to be expectant of Him and be ready for Him when He, when he returns. Woe, woe, woe to the United States of America and all the governments of the, land, of, of the world throughout history who have bent the knee to the Pope. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. 
Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.